Blog Talk Radio. Paranormal Review Radio. Friday night, and you know what that means. It's Paranormal Review Radio Night with your host from New York City, Anthony Agati. And me, Lucy Liebfried from Chicago. The one and only show that gives you the information you crave on all things paranormal. No bull, no fakes, no guessing, just the facts. But the show wouldn't be what it is without our listeners. You all demand to hear the truth, and we are here to deliver it without any commercial interruptions or lame music breaks. You can get that on FM radio and other internet stations. Not on our show and not on your time. This is truly your free radio. That's right, Anthony. Boy, do we have a great show for you tonight. Our phone lines are open, so give us a call. Our show number is 661-244-9831. We definitely want you to call in tonight. The phone lines are open for the entire show, so join the conversation. And if you don't feel like calling in, our chat room is open, so post your comments, questions, or feel free to discuss with other members. Don't forget, we have a Facebook page, Paranormal Review Radio. So stop by and visit to learn more about tonight's show. Anthony, what are we discussing tonight? Man's biggest fear is death. But what's worse than that is when that fear turns into a nightmare and man comes back to life to prey on human beings. Tonight we review everything you ever wanted to know about zombies. And speaking of everything you ever wanted to know about zombies, which is the title of the book our guest tonight has written, tonight we are so excited to introduce to you all Matt Moak, the leading global authority on zombies. Matt has been featured on National Geographic, Spike's hit TV series, Deadliest Warrior, and G4 TV. Matt is also the head of Zombie Research Society and has written several books on zombies, like That's Not Your Mommy Anymore, and his recent book, which I just mentioned, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies. Very fitting for our show tonight. Please welcome to the show, Matt Moak. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Hi, Matt. Welcome for uh, welcome, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. We're excited to have you. Um, So I just want to get right into it. So, Matt, you know, everywhere you turn around, it's zombies, zombies. What is this big fascination with zombies that everyone seems to have? Yeah, they're they're really popular right now, right? It's 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 huge. I think that the 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 answer is a little complex, but there are there are kind of a few reasons that I that I look to. One is that uh, zombies are kind of synonymous with the end of the world, right? You never see one zombie. It's, it's mm-hmm. One zombie equals ten zombies equals ten million zombies, right? And more right. more than ever uh, these days, it seems like we're kind of worried about the end of the world in general. So we're worried about global warming and economic collapse and tsunamis, and you know all you have to do is turn on the news to see the latest disaster from somewhere in the world that looks like, you know, it kind of looks like the aftermath of a zombie outbreak. So so in that way, zombies, you know, it's kind of the sweet spot for zombies. Um, you know, when we're all kind of worried and thinking about the end of the world, zombies fit right into that. So that's, that's one main reason, I think. Uh-huh. So how did you first get started in researching zombies? Were you ever witness to one and then begin began this life career? Did I ever see it? Have I ever seen a zombie? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I have. Fortunately, I have never seen a zombie, and I would like to keep it that way. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I ever had seen a zombie. I'm not sure I'd be on the phone right now or, or speaking with you. <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, I've always been obsessed with zombies. I kind of come to it from the film side. So I actually 
um, you know, when I was a little kid, I used to love horror movies and zombie movies specifically. And uh, I, I, when I was before I would go to sleep, I would think of zombies and monsters and all this stuff, and, and in hopes of having a nightmare uh, when I was asleep because I figured it was like a free movie to me. You know, I mean, it didn't really scare me, but it was like, oh, I don't have to, you know, get money out of my parents or have my sister drive me to the movie theater. I can just get a free zombie movie in my head. So that's kind of how it started. And uh, I actually got my master's degree at NYU uh, Film School. And, and did my master's thesis on zombies. So um, so that's kind of how it started. And then just that obsession grew and grew, and I started asking the question, okay, well, if a zombie were to actually show up at your front door, what would it really look like, and, and how would it function, and how would its brain work, and how would it hunt you? And so that's really how all this stuff got started. Cool. So for some of our listeners out there who may not know, what is a zombie? Yeah, well, you know, interesting uh, fact about that is that actually the Oxford English Dictionary, which is you know, widely, obviously, regarded as the the most uh, complete uh, dictionary of the English language, uh, only has a definition of a zombie as a voodoo slave brought back by a, uh, a sorcerer, essentially, to do slave labor um, and menial labor in the fields and things like that. So that's that's the Haitian voodoo zombie, which is, exists today and is, has a long tradition. It's kind of where the what I call the modern zombie that we see in video games and movies and the zombie that wants to eat you, That's it, it gets its name from food and zombie, but they're not really related. So, so the, the Oxford English Dictionary doesn't really have a, a definition for the zombie that we think of uh, here in the United States. Um, uh, what I like to say, the definition I use is that a zombie is a relentlessly aggressive, reanimated human corpse driven by a biological infection. So that kind of has three important aspects. One is that it's uh, relentlessly aggressive, right? So meaning mm-hmm. you can't negotiate with a zombie, right? You can't, you know, you can't say to the zombie, hey, uh, you know, eat my friend instead of me, or, or you know, there's, <laughs> there's a family of five around the corner uh, getting into Winnebago, and, and they'd be a lot tastier than I am. The zombie will eat you and, and your friend and the family and everybody else. Um, and, and then it's a, you know, reanimated human corpse, meaning that it's uh, fundamentally sort of human in nature. It doesn't have... Um, you know, wings or, I mean, it's sort of using a rotting corpse as its vessel. And lastly, that it's biologically infected. And, and that's really important. It also speaks to why I think zombies are so popular right now, because unlike most other uh, popular monsters, zombies are, the modern zombie, as we know it, is not based on some sort of ancient superstition or myth. So it's not like... Uh, you know, vampires or werewolves that have sort of developed over hundreds and hundreds of years in this, in this you know, tradition of uh, superstition. Um, it, they're really a modern construct that, that originated in 1968 with George Romero's Night of Living Dead. So, so they ring true to us in our sort of modern sentiment. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but so they're biological infestations like rabies, or are they more like complex bioagents? Yeah, well, I mean, there could be a whole host of of causes, right? So it could be a virus, it could be a, a bacteria, it could be radiation. I mean, movies do all sorts of different explanations. But kind of what I mean by biological is that um, uh, is that zombies um, don't have superhuman strength, right? They they don't live forever. They don't have superhuman mm-hmm. strength. They don't climb on ceilings. They can't turn into bats. You know, they're sort of they don't they don't. Um, Aside from the aside from the part of actually a corpse standing back up and walking around, no other aspect of a zombie defies the basic laws of uh, biology, right? So, so they live within mm-hmm. the same rules that we do. And also, the zombie sickness is spread in the same way that we all kind of understand other infectious diseases to be spread. So it's essentially a blood-borne illness, right? Whereas if you think about like a vampire... Right? You don't try to scientifically explain like, you know, how a vampire can hypnotize you with its eyes or why it goes to your high school and steals your girlfriend, you know, or why it, why it sparkles in the sunlight, right? Um, right. Uh, that's a little dig on vampires there. But, uh, but <laughs> you know, you don't sort of scientifically explain that stuff because it's essentially magic, right? I mean, that's kind of what I'm saying. It's that the modern zombie is not perceived as magic. It's sort of a... Um, a virus with legs and teeth. It's kind of like the next step of, in evolution of a virus gone kind of horribly wrong. But again, it may not be a virus. There are a lot of explanations for what what might cause it. Okay, okay. But you know what? 
I was thinking with all the new advancements in the medical field, wouldn't mm-hmm. we be able to stop the spread of a supposed zombie disease in time before mass development? Yeah, potentially. I mean, that's a really good question. And, you know, the interesting thing about that is that is that often you see in movies, you see zombie sicknesses played out in a way that the incubation period is like 20 seconds, right? So mm-hmm. uh, if you think about 28 Days Later, which is a, a popular uh, movie from 2002, um, Danny Boyle directed it um, before he went on to win an Oscar for Slum Dog Millionaire. Um, it, literally, you get a drop of this infected blood in your eye, and you turn into a raving maniac in, in you know 20 seconds. Um, and, and the notion is that wow, it spread so fast that you know it's going to take over the world instantly. But actually, when you talk to health public health experts about it, the real danger would be uh, a zombie sickness that has a longer incubation period because the idea is that it could actually spread around the world before anyone really knew what was going on. So actually a Mm -hmm. slower incubation period is more dangerous. Now, then you also have to look into, well, potentially could it be airborne um, so that that maybe you don't even need to be, um, uh, you know, bitten or or have blood transfer, you know. And and let's let's say it is just bloodborne, Right. But what if it can be transmitted by mosquitoes, like malaria? Malaria is a bloodborne illness that can be transmitted by mosquitoes. Now, malaria kills millions of people every year. So if we kind of know that mosquitoes would not, if we're talking about a rotting corpse, mosquitoes don't, uh, don't suck the blood of corpses. They can actually sense living creatures. They, they hunt by many different senses, um, but they can tell if something is alive or dead. So theoretically, they wouldn't actually suck the blood of a zombie. But let's say I'm infected with zombieism, and I don't even know it yet. And then I get bitten by a mosquito. The mosquito takes that you know, infection, flies a half a mile away, and sucks the blood of somebody else, and transfers that infection to a new person who maybe isn't even in the same county as anyone who, who has the sickness. So you know, that's a way that potentially it could sort of spread all over the place. Wow. You know, when I was doing the research on this, I noticed that the scientific community has actually done studies on zombies and the effect of an outbreak. Why yeah. do you think this is? Yeah, I mean, a lot. You know, if you look at the Zombie Research Society, which is the organization that I um, that I head up, um, our board is made up of leading scholars across many fields. So, for instance, we have the co-director of education at Harvard Medical Schools on our on our board and several leading neuroscientists. We've got a professor of international politics from Tufts University um, who's on the board who studies, you know, how different governments would deal with a zombie outbreak. So I think that the reason that these scientists uh, and, and different scholars are interested in studying zombies in this way is that whether they believe it would ever happen or not, I, you know, I, clearly they're not, you know, uh, quote-unquote nut jobs living in a basement bunker somewhere, you know, heavily armed, mm-hmm. right? They're normal guys going to work and, and publishing papers and all sorts of different things. I think it's a really interesting way to apply their expertise to this, uh, what you might call theoretical or unrealized problem. And again, it's because zombies are sort of biologically based. So, um, so you can actually, you know, the international politics professor can look at a zombie sickness in the same way that you might look at what would happen if a, a, a new and deadly strain of the flu came or was spreading around the world, how would different and, and was you know killing a lot of people? How would different governments deal with it? Well, it's kind of inherently potentially more interesting to go. Well, let's make that flu a zombie sickness, sort of same mathematical model, but kind of much more fun. I mean, one of the okay. things about Zombie Research Society is that you know when people sort of say, "Oh, you guys really believe in this stuff." Like, look, you know, there are different levels of what people believe or not, and to be a little paranoid. So I'm probably on the the side of believing a lot more than some, but but um, but ultimately it's a lot of fun. I mean, there's a reason why we're not the cardboard re- research society, right? I mean, zombies are fun. Right. So right. I think that's right. why a lot of scholars get into it. One, one of our most recent board uh, members, Doreen, is a uh, an epidemiologist who studies new and undiscovered infectious diseases, and she's a professor at the University of Iowa. So her job essentially, is to kind of research where, where the next great deadly diseases will come from and who, how they will spread, you know, from animal to human and all this, you know, really kind of interesting stuff that they can get very heady. And when you apply that to it, all the same uh, models work, but it's just, it's just kind of a lot more. 
Wow. Um, now, you said, now, as you mentioned, you're the head of the Zombie Research Society, and you've mentioned a couple of the members that you have. So mm-hmm. I've got, like, a two-part question here. First off, what is the mission of the Zombie Research Society, and is it true that George Romero, the godfather of zombie movies, is on the board? Right, sure. Yeah, so the mission, first of all, yes, it is true that, that George Romero is on the board. Very exciting. Uh He's been on the board for I guess a couple of years now, so um, so that's there. You know, obviously that was a great you know it was a great honor. I'm very excited yes. about that. But uh, and he rep- we try to get different experts from different fields. So obviously you know George Romero represents kind of the art side, and this and then we have a lot of scientists and different you know scholars. Um, and this kind of speaks to our mission. So the mission of Zombie Research Society officially is to advance zombie knowledge and respect in the arts and sciences. So what, what that means is that, you know, on the science side, um, again, we don't make anything up. So we don't say, oh, there was a zombie outbreak last week, you know, at a Walmart mm-hmm. in Cincinnati, right? I mean, we all know that didn't happen, right? So, mm-hmm. so, um, it's, so, you know, we don't go, we try not to go into fantasy, right? But what we say is, okay, like I said, the zombie would actually show up your front door. Like, let's really study what this would be like on a on a micro level. Like, you know, what would it be like to you if it's at your front door? And, and also on a macro level. So what would it be like to uh, to the, you know, the state of Illinois if it were overrun by zombies? And what would, it, what would the United States do? And what would China do? Um, and then from there, we extrapolate real-world survival strategies. So... So, you know, zombie survival is not is not like a video game. It's not like, hey, let's just get a shotgun and blow a bunch of zombie heads off and this is going to be a ton of fun. No. It, it, when you really do the research, um, surviving a, a catastrophic zombie outbreak is not unlike surviving any other more common large-scale natural or man-made disaster. You know, So you may say that there's never going to be a zombie outbreak uh, ever, right? And we can sort of argue that all day long. Um, but but I live in Los Angeles, and anyone will tell you there's going to be a giant earthquake in Los Angeles. Now, um, uh, we're sort of overdue for one. It could happen right now. It could happen in 50 years, right? For me, that right. that never inspired me to get an earthquake preparedness kit. But it didn't. It, but I do have a zombie preparedness kit, and it works great for earthquakes. So you know, <laughs> real zombie survival it sort of gets you ready for anything. Okay, so. Matt, we're right. We're here right now. We're speaking with you on the air. Yep. Let's say we're interrupted by a special announcement that there has been an <laughs> outbreak of some kind of a pathogen right. turning humans right. into zombies. What are we yeah. supposed to do right now? <laughs> well, I mean, I would suggest, I would highly recommend that we end the interview uh, immediately <laughs> <laughs> um, because we've got bigger, we've bigger things to worry about. Um, but. Uh, you know, the, the thing about it is this, and, and it's kind of what I argue a lot, and, and it, this almost goes back to the earthquake comparison. Um, if you, first of all, it's very unlikely that we would get some sort of announcement like that that happened so suddenly. So it's much more likely that there would be a strange new sickness that we uh, have heard reports of, that, you know, they're calling the new flu or a, or a hybrid form of rabies, that is, is, and then it... And then it sort of comes out slowly that this is what's really going on. So I would probably be on high alert already. I mean, I get on high alert mm-hmm. when I hear some random story about, you know, um, uh, you know, bubonic plague rearing its ugly head in China or something like that, right? I'm like, ah, oh, are they covering up on a zombie outbreak? So, so I would probably have an advanced head up, heads up. But I would argue that if you're not prepared ahead of time, you're kind of in a bad spot. And, and again, that goes back to any disaster. Right? So the CDC recommends that, you know, you prepare with a, a certain amount of food and water and first aid kit and all this stuff in case of a hurricane, depending on where you live, or a tornado, or, you know, you get snowed in in Chicago for three weeks. Um, so it's the same thing. It kind of, if you're not ready, you're not ready. I mean, that's, so, so I would recommend right. that you should work before it happens. Okay. So Matt, yeah. have have we ever been in contact in history, small or large scale, with a true zombie outbreak? Yeah, well, that's that's a really good question. Now, there, I'll, I should start by saying that there are no confirmed zombie outbreaks throughout history, but you know there are a few um, unexplained events 
uh, in recorded history that, that at Zombie Research Society, or at least for me, they kind of make my ears perk up and make me wonder if potentially we could have um, experienced some sort of some sort of outbreak. And and you know, I'll give you one example um, that uh, that is pretty interesting to me. It's it's the lost colony of Roanoke, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with with that story, but um, yeah, somewhat, yeah. It, yeah, in the late 1500s, what was intended to be the first per- permanent British colony to the to you know what will, would become the United States, um, 110 colonists landed on a, uh, in an island off the coast of what is now North Carolina, Roanoke Island, it was a small island. And now they had a, a full camp set up, meaning um, it wasn't just sort of tents. They had you know they built a, um, a cabins and they had a full permanent settlement there, you know, a fort. Um, the supply ship left, and it came back three years later, and everybody was gone, completely disappeared. Now, there are several theories about what happened to these people, um, but there are certain things that have been ruled out. So, for instance, they, didn't, they, didn't, uh, they weren't attacked by, other, by Native Americans in the area. Um, the Native Americans were, were friendly, and there wasn't any sort of uh, conflict that went on. Um, secondly, they didn't starve to death. So there were still uh, available supplies there. Right, and they didn't. They didn't experience some great storm. Their their fort wasn't destroyed. So all these things can kind of be eliminated. Now, some people have theories that that they uh, they thought the supply ship was never coming back, and they went and joined a friendly band of Indians down the coast. Um, there are all sorts of different theories, but but to this day, there is no generally accepted theory for what happened to this 110 settlers. Um, it's never been proven, and and it remains the largest mystery in early American history. Now. That in and of itself is, is, is sort of, you know, doesn't really indicate any zombie uh, outbreak. But there was an archaeologist from Harvard who, uh, I think just three years ago, um, discovered evidence of mass cannibalism on Roanoke and wrote a paper about it. So, so you know, from, from a Zombie Research Society point of view, I, I sort of then asked myself, wow, mass cannibalism. Now, there's no evidence. Uh, cannibalism was not practiced by you know, anyone in that region, let alone the settlers, right? Nobody was a cannibal in anywhere along the coast of the United States ever. So right. what would cause these 110 settlers who weren't attacked from, from the outside, who didn't starve to death, um, you know, who sort of had all their supplies intact, what would cause all of them to eat each other? Um you know, violently eat each other. Um, that for us, you know, that, that sort of uh, gets gets sort of an exciting find. But again, there's no there's no established zombie outbreak throughout history. Now, uh, with, there's a, actually a question in the chat room from. Let me just pull this up here from Second Sight, New York City. Um, and they write, what exactly would the virus do? Eating brains is obviously uh, science fiction. So what would, what would a, a zombie virus outbreak actually cause the, the supposed zombie to actually do to another human being? Yeah, right. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you bring up eating brains. I, I like that. You know, the funny thing about it is if you ask 10 people on the street uh, what zombies eat or, 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 you know, how much they know about zombies, right? You'll get 10 different answers. Right. So some, some kid will be like, oh, my gosh, I love zombies. I, you know, play all the video games. I know all about them. And some, you know, you know uh, some grandma would say, I don't even know what you're talking about, right? But you ask those same 10, 10 people, what do zombies eat? And they'll all say brains, right? That's right. <laughs> Every yeah. single one of them will say brains, you know? The funny thing about that is that in, in zombies – Rarely in any movies or any depictions, artistic depictions, eat, eat brains. Zombies do not eat brains in uh, in any of George Romero's movies. So they didn't eat brains in Night of Living Dead. Um, they don't eat brains in any of the contemporary zombie movies, meaning uh, Zombieland or Shaun of the Dead. Um, mm. They only eat brains in the Return of the Living Dead film series from the mid-1980s to early 1990s, um, which is sort of a spoof series of movies um, that, you know, have zombies talking and um, setting up booby traps and doing mm-hmm. sort of all sorts of goofy stuff, and they also eat brains, and they say brains, and they say brains. It's funny, and it's great, but somehow it's, it, it, it caught on in popular culture, and I think it's hilarious. I'm not sort of trying to poo-poo it, but it's just so interesting right. how that thing that's just in a couple movies caught on, when actually, you know, when I give these some lectures, I talk to some college kids. And I ask them if they've ever seen Return of the Living Dead, 
and they all say no. I say, you know what? I asked you what zombies eat, and you say brains, but you've never seen a zombie eat brains on screen. You're telling me your favorite zombie movie is Zombieland. Nobody eats brains. So right. the, the thing about it is that never that, that always seems strange to me is that um, it's widely thought that to kill a zombie, what makes a zombie sort of undead is that its heart's not beating. So it's being powered by its brain. Uh, you know, however it's being powered, it's being powered by its brain. So you destroy the brain, then you sort of kill the zombie, right? Well, the zombies eat brains. Um, they would be essentially destroying their own reinforcement. Because if they're already eating the brains of the victim, then the victim can never turn into a zombie because it doesn't have any brain anymore to power itself. So right. it's inherently contradictory. Um, secondly, I, secondly, we know, again, if zombies aren't supernatural, if they don't have superpowers... We know from tests that the, the human jaw is not strong enough and the human mouth is not properly shaped to actually bite through the human skull. So zombies may prefer brains, but unless they're using some sort of giant nutcracker to crack your head open or tools or weapons, they're, they're likely not going to have access to your brain. They're not going to be able to get through your skull. So that's another reason they don't eat brains, just sort of pure, you know, pure biology. Um, but to answer your question, in sorry, roundabout way, um, what would zombies be doing? Um, the notion generally is, and again, this is all theory, but the notion is that, for, that, that this relentless aggression causes them to attack, um, to attack living humans, right, other you know, living creatures, and um, thereby spreading the infection. So it's sort of a delivery method. Now, whether they eat people, or not, or just bite and chew, or just you know scratch and claw and whatever, um, that's debatable. But the but for whatever reason, because it's a bloodborne illness, it's aggressively spreading itself through this. You know, I want to get my fluid onto you, into you, spread to you because you are you know alive and not infected. So that's sort of the so it's not- the purpose of it. On some level, then there is some intelligence there, then. Well, no, because it could be, you know, if you think about it, it could just be pure relentless aggression. Now, this goes into zombie brain function and sort of what areas of the brain are working, which is really, really interesting. I'm not a neuroscientist, but, it, you know, it's, it's a very interesting area of study. Um, uh, if they're sort of, you know, if, if we're talking about this, you know, mass aggression, so, you know, just pure aggression, the, the actual zombie may not be cognizant of saying, hey, I want to spread this infection. But the function of that pure aggression is that it spreads the, the, the infection. So I guess, you know, the other answer to that question is, what do they do to people or why are they attacking people? It's because, it's because that, you know, rage center of their brain is switched on. And so they are, you know, sort of pure aggression and adrenaline looking for new victims to attack. So then by definition then, would they <clears> – <throat> Or, or why wouldn't they, maybe in your eyes, why wouldn't they then attack other zombies? Yeah, it's a really good question. So, so that, you know, that really speaks to zombie hunting technique, right? So, so you know, the right. question is, you know, how do they recognize humans from zombies, right? Why wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't they just sort of, you know, or why wouldn't they even attack a tree, right? I mean, why, right. Um, you know, right. why wouldn't they just sort of beat on the ground if they're just randomly aggressive? Now, so, so, you know, you have to look at hunting technique, I, I think, to answer that question. And, and if you see in, in movies and books, they use all different explanations for how zombies hunt. So, for instance, you know, in the Walking Dead TV series that's, that's you know, it's just finished its second season, they've, mm-hmm. zombies hunt a variety of different ways. But one way they hunt is by sense of smell. So in the first season, they showed a couple of the lead characters cover themselves in zombie guts and walk among the zombies because they were sort of covering their smell up with the smell of kind of dead guts, you know, and, and grossness. And so the zombies couldn't smell the living person, and so they didn't attack them. Um, another, other movies, Shaun of the Dead, for instance, they hunt by sense of sight, so that if you and I were to walk through a crowd of zombies, uh, all stiffly and, you know, act like we're zombies, the zombies would right. not recognize us as a human, and we would sort of get away with it until one of us sneezed, and then, and then we, the jig would be up, right? Um, right. But... A really compelling theory that I like a lot, and again, you know, I really have to emphasize this is all obviously theory, and anyone that tells you they know exactly how zombies are going to function, um, you know, we don't have a zombie to dissect and, and discover a lot of this stuff. 
anyone that tells you they know exactly how a zombie is going to function is, is essentially doomed to be wrong. And if you listen to them and take, you know, your, your, your advice from them as gospel, um, you know, they're the jerks that were wrong and, and overconfident, but you're the one getting your leg chewed off, right? So, right, right. Uh, you know, you, so you sort of have to take everything with a grain of salt. But the theory I really like is has to do with the Etruscan shrew, which is the smallest predatory mammal on the planet. And so the, the, uh, you have to imagine like a tiny, tiny mouse or like – like, a, you know, it fits in the palm of your hand, like, like very, very small, the size of a cricket, if a mouse were the size of a cricket. Um, so the, the reason that I like the Etruscan shrew example is that uh, the shrew must um, hunt, it must eat its body weight every day to live. So it's on a constant, mm. relentless search for food. It, it will starve to death if it doesn't eat its entire body weight every day. Secondly... It hunts things that are its same size. So it doesn't hunt tiny gnats or, or you know, little tiny uh, bugs. It hunts crickets so, and, and other, you know, insects like that, that that are actually its same size and weight. And and lastly, the, the, so that's, of course, sort of zombie-ish, right, uh, relentlessly right. hunting things that, that are of equal size. But but the, the compelling part is that, that they, it hunts primarily through the sense of touch. So what a shrew does is it says, you know, it'll see a potential meal, across the field or, you know, on the other side of the tree or whatever, and it will say, oh, I might want to eat that. And so it will go over to it, and it doesn't decide whether or not it's going to attack until it actually touches it. And once it touches it, it says to itself, oh, no, that's that's a beetle. You know, that, I don't like beetles, so I'm not going to eat it. Or, oh, no, that's a cricket. I like crickets. I'm going to attack this cricket and try to eat it now, right? So if we apply this to zombies, it answers a couple other questions that I've always had. Um, so, so imagine if, if I'm a zombie and you're a zombie and we see each other from across the street, okay? We walk up to each other and we touch each other and a, 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 a cold-blooded, rotting corpse feels completely different than a warm-blooded, living human being. I mean, you can feel the heat off a human without even touching them. You can put, just put your hand near a person and you can feel the warmth coming off of them. So, so it's right. easy to, to understand how that would be a very simple distinction. Um, so then let's repeat that again. So the two, two we, we end up standing next to each other and, and, and now we're walking down the street next to each other and we see another zombie and we walk up to that zombie. If you repeat that a thousand times, you have a horde of a thousand zombies walking down the street all together. Now, it's often thought that zombies don't work together, right? Like, it's mm -hmm. not like you're a zombie and I'm a zombie and we come up to a house and I say, hey, I'm going to go around the back of the house and you scare this mm -hmm. family inside in the front, make some big moaning noise, and I'll run out the right. back and I'll trip them and then we can both eat, right? So right, right. You, you inevitably have like a, you know, a thousand zombies attacking your house, but it's ultimately they're all attacking individually. So I always wondered, why are they always together? If they're not working together, it almost makes no sense. But this touch theory potentially explains that, right? Because you just repeat this touch theory over and over as zombies are wandering around a town, and you would end up getting thousands of zombies walking all together right towards your front door because they've decided they don't want to eat each other, and they all happen to be standing next to each other now because the only way they can figure out if they want to eat each other is by touching each other. Secondly, uh, I, I never... it's often... Oh, sorry. The, the other thing is that... It's no, no, I was, I was just, just going to say I never thought of it that way, actually. That that makes perfect yeah, right. sense. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, I, I I was very excited when I when we sort of stumbled, you know, because zombie hunting technique is a bare, big area of research. So, we, you know, we do a lot. We develop a lot of theories. And, and essentially developing these theories, the goal is to blow holes in them, right? Figure out why they don't work. Not, not to be like, oh, look at me. I'm so smart. I know how zombies work. It's like, no, let's figure right. out why this doesn't work. And so we'll hopefully get a better theory. But the second thing it would explain is, is zombies are often thought to have their arms stretched out. You see in movies and you see pictures of zombies walking down the street with their arms stretched out. Now, right. and I always wondered why that was so. Too, why that was the case? If zombies hunted by sense of sight, they would be standing around like an owl, looking around. They would not be walking around with their arms out. Uh, they would be standing still and looking around very intently. If they hunted by sense of smell. Likewise, they would be doing very similarly. They would look like a dog. They would be wandering around sniffing the air everywhere. 
But if they hunt by sense of touch, it would explain why you see them like this, like sort of processing their entire world through their fingertips. They're mm. sort of moving around the world with their arms out, trying to figure out what's going on and what they want to eat. You know, so so it explains kind of those two things that that uh, that, I, that have always really, especially the horde thing, it really always bothered me. It just made no sense, you know. Matt, That's I amazing, amazing. Now, have, now you Matt, you got. Anthony, can I ask a question? Uh, Matt, sure. while you're you're explaining all this, so basically what it's it's appearing to me that it's almost like since there's no thought process put into here, no no uh, it's almost like an innate sense of searching for the food, correct? Right, yeah. And, and again, there are there are some different theories about it. So there there um but but yes, one of them is is uh is this notion that the you know, it's sort of the crocodile brain, the the uh the inner um, pure uh, predator brain, part of your brain, is kind of switched on, and, and you're just like a, you know, that's all you care about. You know, it's just, mm-hmm. I just want to find the next meal or the next attack, you know, the next potential victim, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's the notion. Yeah, because it's generally thought um, that zombies aren't the sharpest knife in the drawer. Now, what I would say about that, though, is that, is that just because they're not, you know, reciting poetry and running for local elections doesn't mean their brain isn't functioning on a pretty high level. Because even to walk down the street and, like, step over debris and walk up a stairway, you know, a, a burned-out stairwell and, and, you know, navigate the world, your brain has to be functioning um, pretty highly. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, not compared to humans, but, you know, compared to, uh, you know, uh, for instance, robots, right? I mean, uh, people of we as as a human race have had a, a very difficult time creating a life sized humanoid robot that can walk on two feet and looks like a person. Um, they're really the only examples are these robots that they have that um, can walk on a very clean surface in one direction and then maybe turn around and walk back. But imagine navigating a burned-out, zombie-infested world, right? I mean, it's very difficult, right? Climbing over barriers and breaking through doors. So zombies, even to keep their balance, have, uh, you know, a decent amount of brain function. Okay. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, a lot. (laughs) Now, Matt, you've written what I think is the most comprehensive book on zombies called Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies, and I highly recommend everyone out there getting this book. Um, I think you can get it on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other specific places, Matt. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, I think but you can go out there. Of, you know, all over the place. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you clearly discuss zombies from the basics to the science, from survival to pop culture. Is, right. If there's one thing that you want readers to sort of take away from this book, what would what would that one thing be? I mean, I think that the one thing is, that, is that zombies, as a as a cultural phenomenon, as a popular monster, the mo- the modern zombie, you know, what I sort of call the modern zombie, just to differentiate it from the voodoo zombie or other forms of of zombie, um, deserves to be respected. Um, and uh, sort of celebrated as, as, in my opinion, the most relevant, the most popular uh, monster of the last 50 years. I mean, really is the monster of our time, in my opinion. And, and, it, and it sort of is the it's, zombies are the Rodney Dangerfield of, of monsters. And they, they get no <laughs> respect. And so the one thing I would like people to take away is that, you know, there is a lot, it, it's not just sort of an accident that zombies seem to be so popular. It's not just an accident that they that they rake in, you know, billions of dollars in video game sales and, 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 right. and blockbuster movies. Um, they're really speaking to certain um, uh, feelings that we have, you know, it's an artistic expression that, that reflects certain feelings that we have in our in our head today. And so in that way, they sort of deserve to be valued. I mean, I'll give you an example of, of kind of how they aren't. Um, uh, Men of the Living Dead is one of only, I think, 500 or so movies that are cast in the Library of Congress for its significant artistic um, 
uh, and cultural importance to the United States. The Library of Congress, I think, catalogs, I think it's, it might be 20, 20 a year, um, every year that are, that are important works, you know, that they want to save forever, right? But, but in, in 2008, when um, the Academy of Motion Pictures, uh, during the Oscars, they did a three-minute tribute to horror, and so they, they, you know, they played this three-minute video and showed all these horror movies because horror, the horror genre is the most popular genre and the most profitable, but it doesn't ever win any Oscars, right? So they were like, oh, well, we got to get some right. horror movies in the Oscars. So zombies appeared on screen in that three for less than uh, one-tenth of a second. They, if you think you would have missed it, there was one brief shot. Meanwhile, you know, zombie movies are raking it in all over the place. Mm. And, and so, the fa- you know, the fact that zombies aren't even considered valid to be shown more be shown for one second on a three-minute horror tribute, it, you know, sort of speaks to the la- lack of respect they did. <laughs> I have, um, and, and just to reiterate again, uh, your book is called Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies, and it is out and available now. And uh, both Lucy and I read the book uh, this week, and uh, amazing. I mean, it literally oh, cool. has every everything you ever wanted to know about zombies you 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 touch the you touch history you touch the science and i loved what you did um with the the pop culture in the movies i love that part at the end there so uh, again i highly recommend that book but i have some some odd questions for you if if zombies are not killed by humans how long can zombies actually live yeah it's a really good question right so that speaks to the zombie lifespan Right. Well, how long, right. you know, you say death span or how, whatever you want to say. But, again, if we're looking at zombies as not supernatural, right, so, so they are, so they don't live forever. I mean, we sort of established they don't live forever. It's not, they're not vampires. It's not like you're going to find an 800-year-old zombie that, like, you know, fought in the, the Russian Revolution or something. Um, right. Uh, so they are a rotting corpse. So... Um, unfortunately, with, with most of this theoretical work, um, many potential answers to questions will just lead to more questions. But what I'll say about um, you know, the zombie lifespan is that if we know it's a rotting corpse and it doesn't live forever, then, then theoretically it's going through the same uh, process of decay as humans do when they die, um, albeit potentially much slower. So what we learn about the different stages of decay in a human is that there are four distinct stages. There's fresh, there's bloat, there's rot, and there's putrefication. So, uh, so, and I might have, actually, I might have mixed those up. It's fresh, uh, fresh bloat. It's either fresh bloat rot or fresh, fresh rot bloat. Anyway, it doesn't. It's not. What we learn. <laughs> okay. What we learn is by the, the end of the fresh stage of decay, which is the first stage, right? Right. If you die, the end of the fresh stage of decay, the bacteria in your mouth has eaten out your brain so much that it actually, you know, uh, oozes out of your nose like yogurt. Sorry to get gross. Right. Um, so, so we know theoretically that the zombie likely does not live past the fresh stage of decay. Now, again, that could be two years. I, I don't really know. But what I will say is if we go back to our Rono, and this is kind of what we try to do is develop theories and then cross those theories off with other theories and compare them. If we go back to our Roanoke Island example, let's say for the sake of argument that was an, uh, a historic zombie outbreak, okay? So in 15, you know, in the late 1500s, um, there was a zombie outbreak on Roanoke. Well, what we know is that that ship left, the supply ship left those people there and came back three years later and everybody was gone. What that means is that if we're assuming that it was a zombie outbreak, that even if the zombie outbreak happened the day the ship left, right, then 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 the lifespan of a zombie maximum is three years. And that's three years from a zombie walking around biting people to actually rotting all the way back into the earth. You know, so it would even be less than three years because for a while, theoretically, the zombie would be lying on the ground, non-functioning, just rotting. But if the ship were able right. to come back and not find any evidence of any living people, and then and then hundreds of years later we find, you know, the bone remnants of this mass cannibalism that the, clearly the ship wasn't looking for. I mean, they weren't forensic, 
you know, they weren't forensic researchers. They, they just sort of didn't see any people and left. So, uh, so we know that, you know, theoretically, the zombies all rotted back into the earth within that time frame. But again, that leads to another question. Maybe they didn't rot back into the earth. Maybe they wandered in the ocean. Um, uh, so then the question becomes, could a zombie have walked from Roanoke Island or swam from Roanoke Island to the, to the, to the U.S. mainland? Because if you can show that it could have done that, uh, could have sort of walked to the mainland, then that kind of blows a hole in the theory. Because then how come there, there wasn't a giant Native American zombie outbreak on the mainland of the United States? Right, um, so right. again, you know, one one potential answer leads to twenty more questions. But that's kind of the fun of it, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I love that. Uh, so uh, now I'm thinking these zombies must take some time to rest. Do zombies sleep? Yeah, that's uh, you asking some good questions. Um, the uh, <laughs> the you know it, it's that's a that's a really interesting question now what what we what we find is that is that living creatures they've done studies on this living creatures um because believe it or not there there's researchers that have had a difficult time figuring out what exactly sleep is and why you need it right. <laughs> even though it sort of seems obvious to all of us when we don't get enough sleep right but um <laughs> but what they found is that is that animals humans included but they've you know they've they've done the test on the animals um uh, if you don't get, if you don't sleep for, I think it was, you know, they did a test with rats, and if they don't sleep for, for 30 days, they literally just drop dead. Like, not drop dead of a heart attack or anything else. They literally just die. I mean, they just stop breathing right. and they're dead, you know? So the notion is that, you know, for whatever reason, everything needs to recharge. Now, secondly, there have been a lot of studies about the reason for sleep, and, and it's been discovered that sort of without sleep, you can't learn, meaning that you know, you learn things throughout the day, but actually when you go to sleep, that's when you that's when it sinks in and that's when you actually file it away and process it in a way that makes it makes it actual functional learning. So, you know, one argument could be, well, if zombies don't sleep, they can never learn anything. Not really. You know, never never learn sort of advance themselves in any major way. So let's hope they don't sleep, right? But Right. But often you see in movies, and, and you know it's described in books too, that um, zombies milling about, right? You'll see these 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 scenes in movies where where the uh, uh, again it's always a horde of zombies, but you know the the survivors are trapped inside a mall, is living inside a mall, and they look out the they they get on the roof of the mall and they look down in the parking lot and they'll see you know thousands of zombies, but they're all just sort of milling about. You know they're not they're not actively like looking for fresh prey. They're just kind of milling about, um, not going anywhere. And one argument is that 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 could be a um, a process of uh, called topor, topor, which is uh, uh, um, displayed in, in several different animals and, and bears are sort of one of them. And it's it's imagine it's sort of like it's not sleep, but it's like semi consciousness. It's as if your computer goes on standby mode. You know. Right, right. I was just going to say that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So your computer goes on standby mode. It's not shut down, but it's it's sort of preserving its energy and prolonging its function in you know, a functionality. So so potentially that could be going on. But again, it's um, some of these zombie behavior questions are really you really get theoretical. And you know, for me, I love that stuff. But but again, there's anyone that's going to give you a simple answer for how zombies behave is is um, is doomed to be wrong in my opinion. Now, in your book, you talk about the uh, survival and what cities may be more in peril than others. Does yeah. it really matter where? Does it really matter where we live, or does it matter how we prepare ourselves? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think that if you're not prepared in general for, and again, for for any number of disasters, depending on where, what region you live in. You know, you're putting yourself at a real disadvantage. But but the thing is this, and, and this is kind of one thing, there are a few things with zombie research that I kind of go back on my word of, well, we anyone that tells you they know exactly what they're talking about is wrong. You know, there are a few things that, I, that I'll be like, oh, well, I know exactly what I'm talking about with this. So um, one of them is that, you know, look, for, for whatever the zombie sickness is, whether it's a, a, a mutated protein or it's a bacteria or 
you know, virus, and whatever incubation period, all these questions that we have. The one thing we can kind of all agree on is that people make zombies, right? So, so without people, there can be no zombies. So if right. you're all alone by yourself, now let alone the concern of, you know, starving to death or going mad or, you know, because humans are social animals, but if you're by yourself, um, you, you will not be attacked by a zombie. You can't be. Because either you will stay healthy and be yourself, or you'll turn into a zombie yourself, and at that point, you don't care. Um, mm. So, essentially, you're safe if you're not around other people. So that's why I would say that where you are, that's one of the reasons that where you are really matters, right? You know, the second reason that's really important is, depending on where you are, there are different different um, amounts of natural resources, there's a different climate, there's different topography. Um, so you could be putting yourself at a general survival disadvantage if you're not prepared in a specific, in, you know, it, for that region. You know, I mean, if I go to Alaska and I've got a, just like, you know, a, a bathing suit and a t-shirt and I'm planning to live through the winter in a post-apocalyptic zombie world, uh, I don't, I don't think I have a very good shot, you know, so that sort of thing. Right. But basically you want to stay away from people. So I would say you being in New York, you're not in good shape at all. In fact, if you ever want a reason not to move, okay, goodbye, here. everybody. Yeah, if you if you ever want a reason not to move to New York City, and you know, I lived in New York City for four years, I loved, I loved uh, New York City, um, but that's that would be, I think, the best reason. You know, if you needed a good reason not to move to New York City, uh, there are a lot of good reasons to move to New York City. But I, I was just going to say that <laughs> zombie survivability is, you know. And the thing about it is this, and I'll give you an example. You know, we, I broke down every state in the United States based on, on zombie survivability, and we used, I tried to use as many different categories as possible. So, you know, some of the ones I mentioned, climate, topography, and all this stuff. But in my opinion, mm-hmm. population density is the most important, is the most important factor. And so if we look at a state like New Jersey, it's got a population density of 1,000 people per square mile. And, and I'll give one other, you know, sort of factoid there. And it has a gun ownership rate of about 12.3%. Okay, but then if we look at a state like Wyoming, Wyoming has 5.6 people per square mile versus a thousand <laughs> people per square mile, and it has a gun ownership rate of like 60, 70 percent. I think it's 68 percent. So imagine Wyoming, one farmer standing on a farm yelling over to the other farmer half a mile away, or rancher or whatever, saying, "Hey, you see any zombies? No, I don't see any over here." And they're both armed to the teeth. Those guys stand a lot better shot than somebody living in New Jersey with a, a thousand people in their one square mile radius of where they live. Um, and, and, the, and, and unfortunately, the entire Northeast is like that. So it's, the Northeast is very, very densely populated with these small states, small um, by landmass, small states, right, that, that are very densely populated and all right next to each other. So not only in New York do you have to worry about the people that live in New York, you have to worry about the overspill from New Jersey. Right. Um, and every other state that you're connected to. So you you just said like okay, so if you're by yourself, you really you don't have a problem. But so basically, this is a human issue. It's not going to affect animals. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's. I mean, you know, that's interesting. You know, in, in movies, I kind of always, you know, and I love all the zombie books and I and and graphic novels, and I kind of try to read as much as I can. But I I, I probably re, you know lean on movies a lot just because that's kind of my background from film school and everything. So, but it, you know, in movies, um, you see it depicted all different ways. So in in, in the original Night of the Living Dead in 1968, you see uh, zombies eat everything. They don't just eat people. So you see them eating bugs off of a tree, for instance. You know, zombies kind of eat any living thing right. they can get their hands on. Um, other movies depict zombies, and, and Walking Dead, the TV show out right now, you know, Walking Dead on AMC, they eat everything. So they'll eat, you know, they'll eat horses, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, so, you, you, so your question, you know, can, can animals become zombies? Now, if it's a blood-borne illness, first of all, I would say that most, is, you know, pretty much every disease that we know of, you know, infectious disease, does not, uh, cannot infect all species. It sort of, you know, mm-hmm. it's, we, it doesn't kind of fit with our model of how we understand it. So, again, if we're trying to be biological about this, and look, someone might say, look, I like zombies that are magical, and I don't like that you're using a biological, you know, that you're applying biology to it. I just, I like it if it's a curse, and that's, that's fine, too. I mean, sort of people can have their own opinions. 
I would argue that the reason, one of the reasons zombies are so popular is they fit in this biological model. But if we're looking at it biologically, for instance, the flu, right? I mean, there's a reason why there's swine flu and bird flu, and, and we can get those, and, and they, they, they jump species, but they're not going to jump all sorts of species, right? The, um, mm-hmm. Bird flu is not going to infect raccoons, for instance. You know, like it just can't. Um, so, so if it could infect different species, the likelihood is it would only be a small amount of, of other species, you know. Um, secondly, you know, it may be so toxic that it kills them, but the likelihood that it would turn them into some sort of zombie creature is very, you know, small, given everything we know about how defect, infectious diseases work. Secondly, I would say, okay, if it's a bloodborne illness, then, then in order to infect an animal, the zombie would have to, even if it wanted to eat the animal or bite it, it would have to catch it. So, you know, the question then becomes, do zombies eat eat animals? Um, and, uh, you know, you, like I said, you see it in movies all different ways. They're often, it's often depicted that zombies are like, like locusts. So they, tr- they pass through a, an area and they eat everything. You know, sort of like, even if the if zombies don't get you, even if you're hiding in a basement somewhere and they never find you, once you come back up after they pass through your town, like every dog and, and cat and everything will be eaten and you'll just starve to death because there's nothing left, right? But my question is, okay, well, you know, do zombies eat animals? Well, it's kind of an easy test. If you think zombies don't work together and they don't use tools, we sort of prevailing theory is they don't kind of use tools. And, and All you have to do is go outside yourself with no help from any friends and no net and try to catch a squirrel. Or, or, like, you know, try to help me catch my dog when it gets out of the yard. Like, it's just okay. not going to happen. So this notion that sort of, like, a deer would stand in the woods and watch as this rotting corpse shuffles up to it and just say to itself, wow, that's weird. This, you know, this stinking rotting corpse is coming right up to me. I'm just going to stand here and let it bite me. Um, seems unlikely to me. So I think the animals would fare pretty well. Okay. Anthony, we do have a question from the chat room. Um uh, Len was Len and Renee were both were asking about the speed of zombies in the movies. Yeah. You have both fast and slow moving zombies. Yeah, you do. Yep. And I and and uh, that really started in 2002 with uh, um, 28 Days Later, which was kind of the first real example of like really you know sprinting zombies. Now, excellent movie. Uh, yeah, good movie, right? Now, purists would argue that that's not a zombie movie. And actually, even Danny Boyle would say that's not a zombie movie. And, and, and even George Romero would say that's not a zombie movie. And what they're, why they're saying that is that um, technically they were still alive, right? So we're jumping over this process of, of the dead rising. So they were just infected people who, um, you know, got this rage virus and wanted to bite and attack all other living creatures. Um, so, you know, people say, oh, they're not undead, so they're not zombies. Now, for me personally, I don't take such a hard stance on it. First of all, I classify them in my book and sort of, uh, you know, um, functionally as I, I call them living zombies. So, you know, sort of the modern zombie is the traditional Romero undead zombie. And then you have the living zombie, which is pretty much exactly the same thing, but they just technically aren't undead. They still need to, you know you could kill them by shooting them in the heart and, you know, their heart is still beating and they need to drink water and they need to eat food or they can starve to death. But um, on a a sort of a personal level, when people ask me about the the fast versus slow or the living zombie versus the undead zombie, I say, you know, if something, if some like raving, raving, uh, relentlessly aggressive creature is, is clawing down my front door to try to get inside to eat me and turn me into one of it, I don't, I'm not really interested in having an intellectual debate about whether or not it's actually a zombie or this one doesn't really count as a zombie. It's like I'm still getting my leg chewed off exactly the same. So, you know, they're sort of zombies enough for me. But, but to answer your question about fast versus slow, I, I, you know, again, purists, I think, take a hard line on the slow zombie. So we had, tw- we had 28 Days Later, which I agree is a really good movie. And then, and then you have Shaun of the Dead comes out, right, a couple years later, and it is, they're slow zombies but they kind of make fun of the slow zombies, right? Mm-hmm. So, they, sh- you know, these two bumbling idiots are able to survive eat by, like, throwing records at the zombies and, like, cracking jokes and, they, you know. And so it sort of made zombies um, seem a little, slow zombies seem a little goofy. 
So then, a year later, Zack Snyder sets out to make the Dawn of the Dead remake. You know, Dawn of the Dead from 1978 was one of George George Romero's second zombie movie and, and, you know, arguably even more iconic than his first one in some circles. But, you know, so Zack Snyder sets out to make in 2004, he, he makes Dawn of the Dead the remake, and he makes his undead zombies fast. So everyone sort of gave 28 Days Later a pass because they're like, oh, well, they're just infected with the sickness, so they're not zombies, so I'm not going to complain that they can run around. But then, you know, when Dawn of the Dead comes out and they're fast, you know, the purists were up in arms and, uh, you know, didn't like it at all. But but I would argue that it's really difficult after something like Shaun of the Dead um, and, and, and so much zombie awareness out there. You know, we're, we're also, we're not shocked really by zombies anymore. We kind of all see, you know, recognize zombies as what they are. Um, so it's difficult to make a slow zombie scary in, in, a two, in an hour and a half movie. Now, they do it in Walking Dead. They try to do it in Walking Dead, right? In the TV show. But that's really a drama. That's not, that's, not kind of, that's not really a horror movie. You know, it's sort of a drama with zombies as the backdrop. It, the, the zombies almost could be anything. You know, I mean, if you watch Friday Night Lights, the, the football, you know, drama series is the same thing. It's sort of a family drama with football in the background, and, and, and Walking Dead is a family drama with, uh, with zombies in the background. So... So right. I think it's difficult to have a slow zombie movie that's that's actually scary. I think it really is. I think it'd be difficult because everyone would just think, "Oh, I could kill those guys," whether it's true or not. So in, in the uh, chat I don't know if that answers the, your question. Sorry. Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. In the chat room, uh, Len Dorman uh, made a comment about shooting them in the head, you know, destroy the brain, destroy the movement, which sort of leads me to my next question. And I think I already know the answer to this, of what you would say, because I've heard you say this before. But in your opinion, what is the best weapon to take out a zombie? Yeah, well, you know, that's a really good question. I, I The first thing I would say is, is that there's, whenever I think about zombie combat in general, I... I um, I think about what um, L. V. Corby or Al Corby said about um, violence. Sort of, he, Al Corby is recognized as one of the leading uh, personal security and home security experts on the planet. He's you know he's on the Oprah Show several times and CNN News and all over the place. And he kind of he invented the concept of the panic room um, in a house, um, and and he's sort of pioneered a lot of different defense especially personal and home defense techniques, he says that when a situation is reduced to violence, you know, when you are in a, in a threatening situation and it actually devolves to, you know, violence, nobody wins. There are only varying degrees of loss. And I think that really, really applies to zombie combat more than any other quote that I've ever heard. And, and what I mean by that is that if you think about an, you know, a zombie outbreak scenario, um, there's no more uh, going to the doctor if you get a little sliver, you know, or uh, you get a cut on your hand. There's no more going to the supermarket to pick up uh, a gallon of milk. Um, there's no more going to the gas station to fill up your, your gas tank. Um, so all, all of your resources are, are limited and, and quickly dwindling. And, and some of your resources are your time and your focus and your energy. Um, and so if you waste your limited resources on dispatching the zombie in front of you, if you have the option not to, if you have the option to get away without reducing the situation to violence, um, it's a big mistake because you've, you've wasted your limited resources, your time, your focus, your energy, um, and uh, you've taken your eye off the larger prize, you know, and especially time. Right? You've given other zombies or hostile humans um, the upper hand so that next time you have to engage in violence, you'll be in a lesser position to be successful than you were last time. Each time you do it, you're in a lesser position than you were last time. Um, so you really don't want to do it ever. I mean, I, and in terms of fight or flight, I mean, I'm like big time flight guy uh, by <laughs> a long shot. But I would say, you know, weapons, um, I don't like firearms personally. I mean, you know, there's no question that a firearm is more effective than, you know, hitting somebody over the head with a, with a, um, uh, you know, a tennis racket or something, right? I mean, clearly, you know, if you're going to shoot something in the head and, and destroying the brain kills a zombie, that's going to work pretty well. The problem that I have with firearms is not that they run out of ammunition, which is the thing that a lot of people bring up. It's that they're really loud. And if you think about a, 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 a catastrophic zombie outbreak, right, 
the world is going to be a very quiet place. There's not going to be a band marching down Main Street. There's not going to be, um, you know, uh, football Sunday, Saturdays or whatever. This is this is right. people laying low, stay, you know, not wanting to draw attention to themselves. So if you start shooting off a gun, you might as well stand on your roof with a dinner bell for every other zombie and or hostile and desperate human within earshot. I mean, if I were wandering, if I were a, a living human wandering around a city by myself, trying to duck zombies and starving to death and dying of dehydration, which you can you can die of dehydration in, th- in as little as three days, by the way. So, you know, quickly you can become very dehydrated if you don't have supplies. And I hear a gunshot, you know, half a mile away in the other side of town. I don't even care if I'm not armed and I don't have any supplies. I'm going to go find that gunshot because I think those people might have supplies. And I'm going to die anyway, so I might as well risk my life to try to steal their stuff. So the last thing you want to do is make any noise or draw attention to yourself. So I, I don't love firearms right. at, only as like an extreme last resort. Now, the next thing people will say is that they like blades, right, like knives and swords and things like that, because blades don't need reloading. That's sort of the typical line in, in zombie survival circles, you know. Blades don't need reloading. But I always sort of answer that, you know, bl- blades don't need reloading, but blades need sharpening. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. you ever try to, you know, you ever try to hit someone with like a really dull sword or like, how about hit somebody with the back end of a machete, like the, the, you know, the, the dull side of a machete, you wouldn't even do any damage or, or hit him with the flat side of a machete. It's like slapping someone. They'd be like, oh, why'd you slap me? Um, right. So secondly, if a blade is very sharp, it's very easy to injure yourself. It, get, it can get stuck in things. So, okay, I hit the zombie in front of me. It gets stuck in their rib cage, and then while I'm trying to get it out, I'm getting eaten by the zombie behind me. Secondly, oh, no, it got stuck in the door frame. Or I missed the zombie completely, and I just cut my leg. Or hmm. I'm trying to get the, 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 the blade that I've sharpened so well out of the sheath, and I'm panicking, and I, cu- I cut my hand open. Now, there's no, again, there's no doctor to go to stitch you up. There's no, there's no disinfectants to make sure that you're not going to, you know, get gangrene and have to ha- cut off your whole arm. So the last thing you want to do is injure yourself. So I really like very, very basic weapons that I can use to sort of strike and get away. And, and so I like bludgeon weapons, so literally like a baseball bat or a steel pipe or, you know, even Sean of the Dead kind of had it right with a cricket bat. I like really, mm. really, really basic weapons that are very difficult to injure myself with and that are very easy to use. And, and that don't make a lot of noise. Yeah, right, exactly. And don't make noise, you know. All right, so Matt, the what, what Lucy and I like to do sort of at the end of an interview is have just a little bit of fun, um, just to go out smiling and, and uh, to give a little fun to the audience listening. So uh, Lucy, if I, uh, Lucy and I have done this with other guests, and it sort of seems to be really fun. Have you ever heard of, and I'm sure you have, uh, James Lipton from the Inside uh, Inside the Actors Studio? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, you know his premise is sort of like he'll give uh, the guest a one-word question and sort of try and, and get the guest to either in one word or two words give a response to that um, off the top of their head very quickly. Um, I'm going to read you. I'm going to read you a little list of zombie movies and TV shows, and you tell me what you think of them off the top of your head in sort of one word or two word answers. Okay. Um, usually, we've done Lucy. We've done this in the past, and usually the guests, you know, they can't quite <laughs> just put it down to one word. It's always been right. a sentence or a paragraph. So, you know, we'll let you take control, Matt. If you want to, if you're able to do it in one word, great. If not, you know, we'd, we'd love to hear your answer anyway. And you I, just I, want to hear my opinion is. about the thing, right? Just my opinion right. about it, what it, it... Exactly. It, it could be your opinion. It could be how you feel. What does it conjure up okay. in you when I say that that, that uh, movie or, or TV show? Um, or, you know, you can... You can say anything you want. You can say, you know, happy birthday, if, if that's your answer. Okay, ready? <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, first one, Dawn of the Dead. Uh, remake is the first word that came to my mind. <laughs> okay. 28 Days Later. Uh, groundbreaking. The Road. Oh, uh, realistic. Shaun of the Dead. Uh, 
I want to say derivative, but I mean that in a really positive way. I mean, I think that, sorry to be more than one word, they did a really good job <laughs> okay. of paying homage to a lot of former, to a lot of past zombie movies in that movie. They did, mm-hmm. they did their homework. Okay. Pontypool. Ah, uh, inventive. The Walking Dead. Uh, I mean, I, um, uh, profound. And well, what I mean by that is to have a a zombie television show on a respected network that's breaking ratings records. I mean, if you would have asked me that three years ago, that if you would have told me three years ago there'd be a zombie show on TV, I would have said no way. So I mean, it's right. really who, who, a big step. Right. Who who would ever have thought that they would have had an audience for that? You know. Oh yeah, and well, I mean, yeah, and, and who would ever thought anyone would gamble on it? And studio executives, I mean, sort of, you know, uh, it's just it's amazing that it's on there, and it really goes a long way towards, in my opinion, giving zombies the a level of respect that they um, that that I you know that I think that they deserve. So it's really really cool from that you know say what you want about the series. Some people, you know, some zombie hardcore zombie guys are like, oh, it's, you know, I don't like it or it's not like the book, comic books, but I just think it's great that, that it's on there. Pontypool is right, a great right. movie, by the way, too. I'm glad you brought that up. It's an excellent movie. Yeah. Okay, the next one is I Am Legend. Vampires. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of I kind of agree with you on that. Okay. No, I mean, um, you, you kind of agree with me. There's no way to not agree with me. I still loved it. it. No, no, yeah, I'm not it, saying there's anything wrong with the movie. It's just not a zombie movie. I mean, there's not, yeah. you know, it, and, you know, the novel I Am Legend is really, re- zombies evolved from vampires, from, from mm-hmm. directly from the novel I Am Legend. So the, clearly there are a lot of similarities. But, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just not a zombie movie. No, it's it, it, and I agree with you on that. It isn't, but it's it's still giving, like you were saying before, the sort of respect and attention to you know to the topic of zombies. It still you know categorizes it and and fits it in that area, which you know I think it deserves. I still think you know, like you were saying before, we we have to get the, the attention out there on zombies and and bring that back to to the audience so that everyone right. understands it all. Okay, uh, the next one, Reanimator. Frankenstein. Not a zombie movie either. <laughs> okay. Dead Alive. Ah. Uh, <laughs> gross. <laughs> That's a good one, though. That, that movie is so gross. So gross. Uh, I mean, the you serpent got, uh, and yeah, the... Re- go ahead. Sorry. You, you, when, when her ear falls off, uh-huh. <laughs> and it gets in the pudding and the guy's awesome. eating it. Oh my gosh. Anyway. So good. Yeah. Um the, the serpent and the rainbow. Yeah, I mean I would say uh, you know, the the thing that came to mind is Mac and me. Um and and, and that's <laughs> just because you know, that's just because uh, um uh Oh gosh, I'm, his name is blank. What's the the guy the the forensic anthropologist who who wrote the oh is it for the Matt Davis? Botanist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's um yeah, what's his first name again? Oh, I can't believe I'm Matt Davis. That. I believe it is. No, it's uh it's not Matt. But anyway, oh man, I can't believe Wade Davis. Wade, Wade Davis. Davis. Oh, Wade yeah, Davis. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so, you know, when that movie came out, he hated it because, you know, he wrote the book Serpent and the Rainbow. And so right. that movie came out and he hated it. And he, I mean, he was so mad that it was, that it was you know, not true enough to his book. I mean, clearly the guy, the guy had, had no experience with Hollywood. I mean, um, because that's kind of the standard operating procedure. But um, he declared it the worst movie the worst movie ever made or something like that, um, which, you know, isn't, isn't true. And, and uh, it's not even the, what I say in the book is it's not even the worst movie made in the year it came out of in 1986, because there was a movie right. called Mac and me, which is like a sort of a shameless ripoff of ET. Um, <laughs> that just, it's literally like one of the worst movies ever made, um, mm-hmm. but it's almost worth watching because it's so bad. And it features uh, Ronald McDonald is a, is a character in it. And he even gets credited <laughs> as himself. In the in the credits of the movie, 
<laughs> and there's just so like bad. extended dance montage in a in a McDonald's parking lot. They basically McDonald's was like, oh my god, Reese's Pieces had this huge hit with ET, you know. Oh yeah. So they were like, McDonald's was like, we want one of those. So they're like, basically right. we're going to fund this movie Mac and Me, which is just horrible, and uh, we want Ronald McDonald dancing, you know, break dancing all over it. Um, <laughs> so bad. Uh, Day of the Dead. Hmm. Uh, underappreciated. Hmm. Yep. Re- Return of the Living Dead. Uh, romp. <laughs> romp. And finally, Night of the Living Dead. Uh, yes. Um, try, see if you I can mean, try and do this one in, in, in one word. Yeah, I mean... I, the, I guess the one word I would say is is epic, you know. Yeah. Even though that's sort of overused these days, I guess. Um, you know, I would have probably said profound if I hadn't already used it. Um, right, right. But just you know, the big, I, I, you know, if I had a larger vocabulary, it would be just the word. I mean, I almost want to say, you know, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious <laughs> or something. You know? Right. It's just like, you know, that's it's just word. everything. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Well, Matt, do you have you know, do you have any uh, thing coming up in the future? Any projects or any things we can look forward to? Yeah, I've actually got a couple book projects in the work works, and we've got um, there's n- and the dates aren't set. The dates aren't set yet, but um, but I've definitely got at least um, two more books coming out, and then and then we've we've got a graphic novel. Um, that's going to be coming out, and hopefully that's going to be relatively soon. I mean, could be, uh, and by soon I mean, you know, later this year or early 2013. But it's a it's a it's a zombie graphic novel. Oh, great. It sort of tries to use a lot of the research cool. we've done and, and take a, a kind of a scientific approach. So it's going to be it, it, it'll be very different than The Walking Dead and sort of not derivative and not kind of following that same vein. But um, but we're working on it. Did, did you work with anybody on that book, or, or is that just by you, you um, alone? No, yeah, I mean, I did, I wrote it, but um, but we've got there's an artist working on it, and then there's actually uh, um, we're talking to a couple of different publishers. We originally intended just to self-publish it, and, and I'll tell you the premise quickly is um, basically it's the notion is that the the Zombie Research Society Advisory Board, which is you know those guys I talked to you about, the Harvard guy and the different scholars. Um, they are in the, in the. They're all the stars of the graphic novel, and and they are who they are in real life. So the guy at Harvard, he's got his real name and his real likeness, and he works at Harvard and everything else. So it's kind of a world that that is a real world, but secretly on the weekends or you know at night or whatever, they go around the world and they stamp out these isolated zombie outbreaks, and they do research on the sickness to try to stop its spread before the public finds out. So they're sort of keeping it a secret from the public. Um, and doing this research, you know. So it's sort of a way to apply a lot of the stuff that we've been working on in a kind of a fun and entertaining way. And, um, and uh, you know, there's sort of, it's called ZDC, Zombie Disease Control, and it's essentially supposed to be a secret wing of the CDC that kind of goes out and investigates these, you know, weird happenings. That's, I love it. Awesome. I love it. Cool. Yeah. I, it's been a lot of fun so far. I've got a great artist working on it, so. Oh, well, that's well, awesome. Th- th- thank you so much, Matt, for, for joining us tonight. And um, I just wanted to reiterate again, uh, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies by Matt Moak. I highly recommend this book. Lucy, you read this book. What do you think? I loved it. I loved it. I, I'm a freak for zombie movies, so I love the fact that you played in all the movies and all that. And I just thought it was great. I read it in one night. It was awesome. Oh, that's oh, that's super cool. Hey, I assume you guys have seen Rec, right? R E C, the 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 um, Spanish zombie movie. It, it's like the living. No, zombie I haven't. It. Oh man, you got to see it. It's it's just called you know it's just it's as if uh, the the uh, short for record you know so the the title is just R E C in all caps, and it's okay. um, right. it's great. And they actually have, I mean it's it's that twenty eight days later sort of fast you know, living, scary zombie. And it's just really, really good. And, and they actually already have Rec 2 is out. Um, and so you can get both of those on DVD. And, and, and like I said, they're great. And then Rec 3 
is in theaters in, in Europe, and it's coming to DVD, I think, later, like this summer in the United States. Awesome. But you should definitely at least check out, you know, Wreck and see if you like it, because it's, it's a really, really, it's really scary. It's a good movie. Okay. We will. We Great. definitely will. Matt, thank cool. you so awesome. much. This has been so much fun for me. <laughs> this has been awesome. Yeah. yeah, I had a blast. It's good talking. It's always fun talking to zombies. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. And we'd love to have you back on the show again sometime in the future. Maybe when uh, CDC, <clears throat> excuse me, ZDC comes out, we'll have you back yeah, on the show. Time. Sure, absolutely. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Ha- have yep, a great stay weekend. Stay. All right. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye. That was Matt Moke, everyone. That was awesome. <laughs> That was, oh. that, that was that was really really interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I love zombie movies. Um, I'm not a fanatic like you are, Lucy, but um, I, I, I love a good zombie movie. I love any horror genre movie. Uh, you know, anything. Um, and and this was really interesting. I loved his answers. I loved um, how he just took pretty much almost. Uh, first of all, he answered every question that we had uh, amazingly, and uh, he was able to give scientific background to almost every every type of topic that that we threw at him. And, and uh, uh, I just I loved it. I loved that it. it was great. Well, he actually made the subject of zombies a little bit more scary for me because now I have a scientific reason in back of all this. <laughs> <laughs> well, he made it more real, you know. He, you know, <laughs> he really if, you, did. <laughs> if you didn't have a question about it or, or never thought about zombies before, I can guarantee you right now that you're thinking, hmm, you know what? I'm going to lock my front door tonight because who knows what will happen while I sleep. Okay. Well, then you know what? Um, let's see. Let's. Do you want to go into the the bit of research that we have? Sure. Go ahead. Okay, well, you know what? Did you know that the zombie phenomenon exists within the Native American culture? Well, it really does. But it's not exactly like the Hollywood zombie that you think of. Um, The Wendigo is a traditional belief system of the various Algonquin-speaking tribes in the northern United States and Canada, most notably the Ojibwe, the Salto, the Cree, the Nascapi, and the Innu people. Now, though the descriptions they vary common to all these cultures was the idea that the wendigo goes where uh they were malevolent cannibalistic supernatural beings of great spiritual power they were strongly associated with the winter the north coldness as well as famine and starvation and if you watch um game of thrones this sounds very familiar okay the wendigos were also embodiments of gluttony greed and excess never satisfied after killing and consuming one person. They were constantly searching for new victims. Whenever a Wendigo ate another person, it would grow larger in proportion to the meal it had just eaten so that it would never be full. Wendigos were, therefore, simultaneously constantly gorging themselves, and they were also emaciated from starvation. Now, the myth served as a method of encouraging cooperation and moderation among the Indian tribes. I can imagine how a native adolescent hearing these monsters would tend to tr- toe the tribal line. <laughs> well, you know, a little bit across the uh, the globe in Chinese culture, kionchi, literally translated from Chinese meaning stiff corpse or zombie, are reanimated corpses that hop around killing live creatures to absorb life essence. This is sort of a supposed belief. The Kionchi are undead and created as a result of a restless spirit. So suicide, someone who's been murdered or has unresolved issues in life, someone that's had an improper burial or been buried in a site with a bad feng shui, or someone who was evil in life are all likely candidates for becoming one of the hopping undead. Kionchi are very easy to spot, dressed in traditional robes, Generally, their appearance can range from unremarkable, as in the case of a recently deceased person, to horrifying, you know, rotting flesh, rigor mortis, as with the corpses that have been in the state of decay over a period of time. A peculiar feature is their greenish-white furry skin. One theory is that this is derived from fungus or mold growing on corpses. They are said to have long white hair all over their heads, 
and they may be animals. They, the, you know, the influence of Western vampire stories brought the blood-sucking aspect to the Chinese myth in more modern times in combination with the concept of the hungry ghost, though traditionally they act more like Western zombies. Sounds like the Kaneoshi is more like an evil rabbit than that furry skin with uh, with the furry skin than a zombie. <laughs> well, you know, wait a minute. What about non-human zombies? And Matt sort of touched on this before, but it might like you know it might sound like something out of a sci-fi, but plenty of parasites can control the minds of caterpillars, roaches, crabs, and you know maybe even us. In many cases, scientists don't know exactly how these creatures achieve mind control. The spider. Plesiometa argira is an expert builder of perfectly round webs, but with one sting, a parasitic wasp can take over its mind. The wasp deposits its larvae inside the spider's body along with a new blueprint. Instead of building its web, the spider spends the last night of its life constructing a silk cocoon, which becomes home for its killers. When the silk sack is done, the larvae kill the spider. Then they take up residence in the cocoon, suspended safely above the predators of the rainforest floor. Pretty amazing, just like the the boker of the Haitian culture. Hmm, yeah. Well, to start explaining about the zombie apocalypse, let's first outline what countries are more likely to see a zombie apocalypse. I gathered this top ten list from Matt's website, Zombie Research Society, and he outlined some pretty interesting facts and criteria that I felt it was worth mentioning. Now, before I start the list, for those listening, yes, the U.S. is on this list. So here we go. Uh, Number ten is Switzerland. Though Switzerland is by far the most densely populated country to make the list, its compulsory military service and a citizenship armed to the teeth give it the number 10 spot. Number 9 is Argentina, the eighth largest country in the world by land mass. Argentina is sandwiched by the Andes Mountains and the Atlantic Ocean. Its urbanization keeps it from climbing higher on the list. Number 8 is Finland, the Finnish benefit from being surrounded by other countries strong in zombie survivability and their low population density of just 41 people per, per square mile doesn't hurt either. Number seven is Norway. Norway came in second in gold medals at the 2010 Winter Olympics, showing that they know how to thrive in icy conditions. A lot of snowy land and a few hardy people is a recipe for survival. Number six is Bolivia. With mountains to protect from their neighbors and the worst economy in South America, Bolivians are used to managing without modern conveniences, and they can ably fend for themselves. Number five Kazakhstan. Now, Barat made the whole world laugh at this little country, but Kazakhstan may get the last laugh. The rugged terrain, formidable climate, and an extremely low population density are key survival factors. Number four is Russia. Low population density, huge land barriers, and a battle-tested people give Russia the number four spot. If the Nazis couldn't take Leningrad, there's no reason to think that Nazi zombies will. Number three the United States. With over 83 people per square mile, the U.S. is considerably more dense than any other country in the top five, but its heavily armed citizenship is more ready for battle than most. Number two, Canada. Though its 35 million residents are packed along a thin strip at the country's southern border, gun ownership is common, and there's plenty of room to head north when the stuff hits the fan. Number one, Australia. This vast nation grabs the top spot because of its population density of just 7.5 people per square mile and the fact that it has the world's biggest moat surrounding it on all sides. You know, there was a uh, uh, another section from the Zombie Research Society that I found really interesting. Matt also created a historic map highlighting some of the areas around the world that may have already encountered a, a zombie infestation. And he actually, we talked about the Ronick uh, story earlier in the interview. And um, uh, although it's not conclusive, it does have question marks all over it. And just like the paranormal, these historic stories should be explored further. So let's talk about some of these stories, and maybe you will believe and maybe you won't. But here are the facts. 
the Ecuadorian Amazon people, the primitive Javaro people of the Ecuadorian Amazon are one of many headhunting cultures found throughout history. But what set them apart was their singular practice of carefully collecting each head they removed, then boiling them in scalding pot for up to three weeks. This process created tiny shrunken heads, an oddity made famous by explorers at the turn of the last century. But even more strange is the Javaro's reason for going through such trouble. They claim their ancestors had faced a great demonic menace many hundreds of years before, and each generation was obligated to continue the practice or risk total tribal extinction. We've already discussed the possibilities that another ancient civilization of Latin America was wiped out by the undead. Uh, now ZRS researcher Scott Laborde suggests a similar set of circumstances from the Javaro, but with a very different outcome. Quote, in a time of conquest, the Javara may well have come across a tribe already consumed by some undead plague. Death by decapitation would not work in that case, as detached zombies' heads would continue to look around and gnash their teeth. Much of the horror of the Javaro, no doubt. Laborde goes on to argue that the extreme ritual of sewing the eyes and mouth shut before boiling the, the disembodied head would be a logical step to take when faced with such a bizarre and ungodly enemy as primitive zombie horde. Furthermore, cooking the brain until it becomes a worthless pile of mush is no doubt an effective way to ensure any remaining life force is removed. Because the Javara were known for their veracity in battle, the board concludes that they must have been able to overcome the zombie threat they faced so long ago. But the fight left a permanent mark on the tribe, as evidenced by the tradition of head shrinking and the dire warning passed on from one generation to the next. Now, here's one that's pretty popular now in 2012, the Mayan civilization. At its height, which was 250 to 900 AD, the Mayan Empire was one of the most densely populated and culturally dynamic societies in the world. The city of Copan alone contained more than 6,000 structures spanning over 27 square miles and was just one of the many great Mayan urban centers spread across present-day Mexico, Honduras, and Guatemala. However, by the 10th century, these ancient cities were being strangely and suddenly depopulated, leading to the complete collapse of the Mayan civilization. The reason for this collapse remains one of the biggest mysteries in archaeology, but ZRS researcher and historian Eugene Frederick now suggests a compelling explanation for the extinction, and he says zombies. Frederick notes that all other prevailing theories, disease, famine, war, revolt, fail to account for the notable lack of buried human remains. In any traditional mass casualty scenario, an abundance of archaeological evidence is left behind, including grave sites. Quote, the ghost towns of Maya House precious few such sites, echoing a panic so great, an extermination so fast, that this once proud people, steeped in tradition and ritual, had no choice but to leave their dead where they fell. He goes on to, to cite reports of widespread cannibalism at the end of the Mayan civilization, suggesting something much more sinister than a simple drought or cross-tribal dispute. Bones found in and around Mayan cities show signs of being violently ripped from their sockets and chewed to bits on the spot. Evidence has, has even been found of children eating their parents, an entire village devouring uh. themselves with a matter of days. Aww. Though Frederick's Though Frederick's theory is a bold one, it can no more be confirmed or denied than any other. As of today, there is still no generally accepted explanation for why one of these most one of the most culturally advanced civilizations on the planet was wiped out in an, in an impossibly short span of time. Was it the first zombie apocalypse, or even just one in a long string of unrecognized outbreaks throughout human history? No one knows for sure. The Chaco Canyons in New Mexico. Now, one of the most advanced tribes in early North American history was the Anasazi people of Chaco Canyon, Canyon in New Mexico. They thrived for hundreds of years in the fertile Red Desert Canyons, growing their culture and building impressive ancient villages. But the, at the end of the 13th century AD, the Chaco Canyon people mysteriously and permanently disappeared. Though no, no universally accepted reason for this sudden decline has been found, 
Recent archaeological discoveries have led ZRS contributor Ben Schuster to suggest that a zombie plague may have been at work. In 1997, a large quantity of Anasazi human remains were uncovered that showed evidence of death by violent dismemberment and cannibalism. Other ex excavations of sites from the same area have revealed many more unburied, dismembered, and partially eaten bodies. These findings are particularly disturbing because there is nothing in the Anasazi tradition to explain why a peaceful people would resort to eating other human beings while they were still alive. Furthermore, the possible explanations of war and famine have been largely ruled out by experts. Existing theories argue that cultures as desperate as the ancient Roman Empire and warrior tribes of the Ecuador may have experienced their own infestations of the undead. Though we may never have conclusive proof about what happened to the Anasazi, the mystery of Chaco Canyon is just another reminder of the fragility of civilization in the face of an overpowering zombie threat. The Lucy, do you want to take this over? Uh, the Roanoke Colony in North Carolina. Uh, in 1857, the colony of Roanoke was established on a small island along the coast of present-day North Carolina. 115 men and women eagerly arrived at what they thought would become the first permanent English settlement in the New World. The group was well stocked with supplies. They lived in secure structures that offered good protection from the elements and any unfriendly neighbors. The mystery of Roanoke began when a supply ship returned in 1590 to find not a single living soul and no evidence of any war, famine, or any other possible reason for the colony's complete disappearance. In fact, there is still no generally accepted explanation for what happened to those settlers. ZRS researcher Andre Freeman suggests that it may have been the work of zombies. Now, Freeman considered the findings of noted Harvard archaeologist Lawrence Steger, who unearthed evidence of mass cannibalism at the Roanoke site. He also points to reports from local tribes stating that the colonists died in a great war within their own ranks. Quote, a sudden undead plague sweeping through the unprepared colony would quickly become a horrific violent feast, leaving not a single man, woman, or child alive. He goes on to suggest that the relative isolation of the settlement and the time elapsed before the return of the supply ship would allow for the remaining colonial zombies to rot back into the earth without any humans left to feed on, so no way to spread the infection. The zombie outbreak would have simply died off. Now, if Freeman is correct, there could be something sinister still in the ground on Roanoke Island, waiting to be released into a modern population that is more advanced, more connected, but just as unprepared as ever. So, believe it or not, the National Center for Disease Control announced last year that they are aware of a zombie apocalypse. And they actually issued some preparedness tips for U.S. citizens. Now, we all know that they're not completely serious about a zombie apocalypse. They basically issued these tips in case of any emergency and use the zombie field to stir up attention to it. But whether or not they believe it, it's still a good idea to prepare yourself for anything that might happen, even a zombie attack. So here's what was issued by the CDC. The rise of zombies in pop culture has given credence to the idea that a zombie apocalypse could happen. In such a scenario, zombies would take over the entire country's roaming city streets, eating anything living that got in their way. The proliferation of this idea has led many people to wonder, how do I prepare for a zombie apocalypse? Well, we're here to answer that question for you and hopefully share a few tips about preparing for real emergencies too. So what do you need to do before zombies or hurricanes or pandemics, for example, actually happen? First of all, you should have an emergency kit in your house. Now, this is going to include things like water, food, and other supplies to get you through the first couple of days before you can locate a zombie-free refuge camp or in the event of a natural disaster. It will buy you some time until you're able to make your way to an evacuation shelter or, you, or until the utility lines are restored. Now, bef, below, uh, here are a few items that you should include in your kit. 
Now, for a full list, you can always go to the CDC emergency page. Water, one gallon per day per person per day. Food, stock up on non-perishable items that you eat regularly. Medications, now this includes prescription and non-prescription medicines. Tools and supplies, a utility knife, duct tape, battery-powered radio. Sanitation and hygiene, household bleach, soap, towels. Clothing and bedding, a change of clothes for each family member and blankets. Important documents, have copies of your driver's license, passport, and birth certificate, just to name a few. First aid supplies, although you're a goner if a zombie bites you, you can use these supplies to treat basic cuts and lacerations you might get during a tornado or a hurricane. Now, once you've made your emergency kit, you should sit down with your family and come up with an emergency plan. This includes where you would go and who you would call if zombies started appearing outside on your doorstep. You can also implement this plan if there's a flood, earthquake, or other emergency. Identify the types of emergencies that are possible in your area. Besides a zombie apocalypse, this would include floods, tornadoes, or earthquakes. And if you're unsure, contact your local Red Cross chapter for more information. Pick a meeting place for your family to regroup in case zombies invade your home or your town evacuates because of a hurricane. Pick one place right outside your home for sudden emergencies and one place outside your neighborhood in case you're unable to return home right away. Identify your emergency contacts. Make a list of local contacts like the police, fire department, and your local zombie response team. Also, identify an out-of-state contact you can call during an emergency to let the rest of your family know you're okay. Plan your evacuation route. When zombies are hungry, they won't stop until they get food, you know, brains, which means you need to get out of town fast. Plan where you would go and multiple routes if <clears throat> multiple routes you would take ahead of time so that the flesh eater eaters don't have a chance. This is also helpful when natural disasters strike and you have to take shelters fast. Now, if zombies did start roaming the streets, the CDC would conduct an investigation much like any other disease outbreak. The CDC would provide technical assistance to cities, states, or international partners dealing with the zombie infestation. This assistance might include consultation, lab testing, and analysis, patient management and care, tracking of contacts, and infection control, including isolation and quarantine. Now, it's likely that an investigation of this scenario would seek to accomplish several goals. Determine the cause of the illness, the source of the infection. Is it a virus? Is it a toxin? Learn how it's transmitted and how readily it's spread. How to break the cycle of transmission and thus prevent further cases. And how patients can best be treated. Not only would the scientists be working to identify the cause and cure of the zombie outbreak, but the CDC and other federal agencies would send medical teams and first responders to help those in the affected areas. Wow. What a show tonight. I, th I think I'm zombied out, Lucy. Uh, yeah. You know what? We should move on to the news and then the fan of the week, which is my favorite part of the show. All right, but, but before we go there, you know, we have not promoted any paranormal groups in a while, and that's because we have not received any email requests. We miss promoting your group, so what are you waiting for? Just send us an email at paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com with my promo in the subject line. Be sure to include your group's name, all the names of your members, and any interesting facts about your group or any of your investigations. We love giving back to the paranormal community. I don't know how many times I've got to say that, Lucy. <laughs> and I hope, I hope that this helps get your group and your mission out in, out in the public for everyone to notice. Okay, so Lucy, why don't you share your news piece with everyone? Wait a minute. Actually, Lucy, I just want to mention something. Um, okay. I noticed this today. I noticed this today, Lucy, and I don't think you you noticed it. Today is April twenty seventh, correct? Yes. 
Okay, today we have marked our 27th show. Oh, my God. Did you know that? <laughs> no, I you didn't know, even think about that. Talking about the paranormal, this is the second time this has happened to us. You know, today is April 27th. We've marked our 27th show since we started. In January, do you remember we did January 13th, which was Friday the 13th, the first Friday uh-huh. the 13th of this year. We hit our 13th show on January 13th. This is the second time we've done this. This is awesome. <laughs> I don't know. This is awesome. I don't know if it means anything. I don't know if it means anything, <laughs> but I thought I'd just figure I'd just share it. Maybe we'll hit another mark somewhere along the lines, but <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Okay. Share share your news piece with everybody. Okay. Well, this is from Vanguard.com and it was posted on April 22nd and it's basically the Lazarus miracle in a cure. And it's how a 67-year-old grandmother resurrected after 12 days. This story is by Tayi Oberto, and this took place in a Corondo state. And the 67-year-old mother of three came back to life 12 days after being clinically pronounced dead. And it's stranger than fiction, you might say. But this is the story of Victoria Gemsibola Batunde, and she was certified dead on January 7th. She would have been buried almost immediately, but something delayed the burial. There was a nationwide strike against the removal of fuel subsidy, and it made impossible for her family to gather to arrange her burial. So they eventually picked a date, and the children were on their way for the burial when she woke up. Now, this was 12 days later. On Saturday, now her son told, uh, he's a pastor, Andrew Ozemina, told Vanguard on Saturday, January 12th, around 10 o'clock, his wife got a call that his mother, his mother-in-law, had been with him. She was seriously ill, and she was being admitted to a hospital. He said the sickness was so serious that, and I'm quoting, she could give up the ghost anytime soon. They got another call at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they said that she was confirmed dead by a doctor's report. Now, meanwhile, the body was rejected at the hospital because of the, sp- uh, because of the strike, and the only option that they had was to bring the mortuary attendants to embalm her at home. They already had a death certificate. They started telling all their friends. Now, this strike lasted for more than a week. Now, since the body was at home and not in the mortuary, the family had to have mortuary people come in, and they were administering a vaccine called chlorophyll on a daily basis to keep the body from decaying. Nine days later, this woman sneezed, and the mortuary attendant who was taking care of her ran out of the room, called the family members, and said, come look and see. After she sneezed, she opened her eyes. She didn't say a word for three days, and people weren't sure, actually, if she was alive, awake, or or what was going on. Naturally, she was shocked, and she didn't believe it until the whole thing was explained to her. After she recovered and regained her memory, she told her family that she had a message that the Lord had given her for the body of Christ. Let's see. The doctor said that it was very rare to see someone who was dead for as many days as her come back with all the body parts still functioning normally. And this is including with the chloroform, and it's an acid that was injected into her body for the preservation of of her corpse. So Mrs. Batatunde said that she went to heaven, that she saw Jesus seated at the right hand of God. Jesus took her to hell. And she saw all those that had been in hell for more than a thousand years, and they were being tormented day and night. She said she also saw angels worshiping and singing round the clock in heaven and the gates, and the entire streets of heaven were pure gold. Afterwards, Jesus told her that she had to go back to the world and finish her purpose on earth and to inform other Christians about what they saw. So Vanguard is saying now that next Sunday they're going to present the outcome of this story, and they're actually trying to get hold of the death certificate so that people can see that this actually did happen. That's pretty amazing, 12 days. 12 days, and she had that uh, acid in her system, and she's fine. Mm. Wow. Well, 
my news piece actually is not a news piece. I wouldn't call it a news piece. It's actually an announcement from the Sci-Fi Channel. And uh, the Sci-Fi Channel put out this sort of promotional announcement on April 24th that it has greenlit three new paranormal reality shows for this year. I'm really excited about this, actually. And one show in particular I am really, really excited to see how well it does, just because of one of the hosts that are going to be on it. So, uh, speaking of that, the first show, there's three shows, the first show that um, they are promising for this year is entitled Paranormal Highway. And they're saying that it's going to come out in the summer. And Paranormal Highway puts the pedal to the metal as Jack Osborne, Ozzy Osborne's <laughs> son, and Dana Workman investigate the most frightening claims of paranormal activity along America's remote back roads. Fueled by eyewitness interviews and evidence collected by state-of-the-art equipment, Jack and Dana will travel alone, self-documenting self -documenting their harrowing road trip while coming face to face with paranormal legends, I think that's actually pretty cool. That sounds really good. <laughs> I wonder how Jack is going to do on this one. Um, <laughs> the the second show is titled Ghost Mine. In the remote woods of Oregon lays one of the richest gold mines in the United States. For the last 100 years, it has remained abandoned until now, soon to be reopened by a scraggly group of miners. These hardy souls will battle the elements to find their fortune. But with a rich history of paranormal activity surrounding the mine, they may just find something else. So I'm curious to see if this is just a, um, a one-off show. I'm not sure if this is going to be a series or not, because it seems as though it's going to be the same guys at, a, at one, lo one particular location in Oregon. Right. Um, you know, and it may just be... Maybe a special that they're going to have, but anyway, it's pretty interesting that uh, that they're greenlighting this particular show. And the the last show is titled School Spirits, and they're saying that this is going to premiere in June. So, in hopefully maybe four or five weeks, we'll get to see this one. School Spirits will tell the true ghost stories of hauntings that have happened at schools across the country. The stories will be told in first-person narratives through the testimonials of real students, teachers, parents, and staff that have encountered the paranormal activity. Blended with bone-chilling cinematic reenactments to further bring the haunting experiences to life. Now, what was interesting, Lucy, and I think you're going to love this, the executive producers are Mark Burnett, who has shows like The Survivor and The Apprentice. <laughs> And uh, Seth Jarrett and Julie and Sonia Jarrett, um, which are the producers of Celebrity Ghost Stories. So that's a pretty good team, first of all, to have Mark Burnett on there um, doing something on the paranormal. So this is this is sort of, I guess, like ghost stories, but with a uh, a school twist to it. So pretty yeah, interesting. So look like, out for those. It sounds interesting, but it also sounds like Ghost Story meets Survivor. You've been voted off the tribe. <laughs> <laughs> You've been voted out of the ghost room. But, you know, I, I think it's it's sort of like ghost stories, but, you know, I think they're trying to appeal more towards the teenagers um, because they've got this school twist to it. So it may be interesting to see. Uh, I'm more interested in seeing Paranormal Highway with Jack Osborne, so yeah, I can't wait for that to start. Good. And, and it, it says the summer, but it doesn't say for that particular one, Paranormal Highway. It doesn't say what month. So, you know, keep keep an eye out for that for those shows coming out this year. Okay. Well, can we get to my favorite part of the show? And Absolutely. This is where, and this is where we announce the Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week. And this week it is a uh, listener. She's a friend, and she's just absolutely awesome. And she always posts. And she's just wonderful. And it's Sharon Swift. Yay! Yay! Congratulations, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, well, I guess that's it. You know, I feel much more prepared for the zombie apocalypse now. I have my emergency ration bars and my stun gun. I'm ready. How about you, Anthony? (laughs) 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 Seriously, this was a fun show. Big thanks to Matt Moak for joining us. And remember, you can pick up his book, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies, at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Anthony, thank you for another great show, and thank you, everyone, for listening in tonight. The best prepared fans around. Now, study your notes. There is going to be a test. (laughs) (laughs) Now, we hope you enjoyed the show. Stop by our Facebook page and tell us your thoughts. We do this show for you, our friends, our family, and loyal fans. Now, please join us next week as as we review numerology, with Cheryl Patton. She's the host of One Woman's Wisdom on Blog Talk Radio. We're counting on you. I had to say oh, that. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I'm going to ask her about the 27th show on the 27th. I mean, that, that's something that first thing I thought about. I was like, okay, we got to ask Cheryl. But Cheryl <laughs> is actually going to do some readings for a few lucky callers. And she's also going to be giving away an awesome prize to one lucky listener that night. So you really don't want to miss this show. So on that note, have a paranormal week, everybody. Good night. Good night. Paranormal Review Radio.